Welcome to uh, to Astronomy Thousand One for uh, for summer twenty twenty one. My name is uh, Dr. Briley. Then I'll be your your sort of host, your professor for the uh, for the next five weeks. While we talk a little bit about the stars and the skies and and how we uh, how we sort of figure out things and uh, that are going on up in the sky. So, gosh. Um, I guess maybe we'll start off though um, just with a quick run through of the syllabus, just sort of so you know what to expect for this course. Um, and let's see, so a syllabus, and let's see if I can get this going. Ah, there we go. So this is on the As You Learn page. You can go there, read through the syllabus. I'm just going to highlight a couple of the things and that, that, that are important, like there I am, that's my name, Dr. Briley. Um, that's my email, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I've got my phone number on there, that's my office phone. If you call it, um, odds are I won't be there, but it will, you you can leave a message and that message then will get digitized and, uh, and sent to me. Uh, we've got the Zoom link for the class then, which is also basically my telephone number, my office phone number, um, all the office hours. If you want to tune in for the lecture like this and do the live thing, um, that's the link. That's also then uh, the link for the labs. And so uh, the office hours then, basically the, the couple hours then after the lecture, if you want to... Uh, you know, hang out and ask questions about anything or ask, you know, if you're, you're watching this uh, recorded, you know, you want to come in the next day and ask questions about what you watched, um, you can stop by the Zoom link then, those office hours, Monday through Thursday. Um, they're also then basically sort of the lab hours, Monday and Wednesday from, from 8 to 10, I'll also be there. Or um, really just email me that if those times don't work for you and we'll, we'll set something else up. Um, cool. There we go. Um, and as I mentioned then, probably the easiest way to get in touch with me then is through the, through the email. The lecture materials, exams, announcements, grades, all of that then we're basically, it's just basically going to go through, uh, through As You Learn then. Um, and you know the As You Learn website, what am I saying? You, you've been doing this for a while then. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, the textbook then, and I, there might be some confusion with the bookstore about the textbook, but um, Universe, St uh, Solar System, Stars, and Galaxies by Seeds and Backman. There's a newer version of the book, Foundations. I'm not sure if the bookstore accidentally gave us that or not. Um, so uh, that's something to uh, that's something to work on. That's something I got to figure out. Then, um, logistically, then the course. This is 100% online. There aren't any. Uh, there aren't any meetings. Hold on a second. I'm in the dark here. Ah. The stain. Uh, there it is. We just turn the lights up a little bit so you can see me better. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's maybe a little better. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah. okay. So, <laughs> the way this works then is there aren't any, you know, required specific in person meetings. Um, the delivery format for the course is asynchronous. The, the lectures like this are recorded Monday through Thursday then from, from about 10 to, to noon. And I encourage you, like some of you are doing today then, to stop by and to do this thing live so you can watch and you can stop me if you have questions, something like that. Um, but if you can't make these times, um, you can basically then just watch the recording. So basically every day it'll be about a, a two hour recording then. I'll put breaks in it then so you can <laughs> you can stop, but uh, but that's basically then the class is is these uh, these, these sort of recorded lectures and and of course there will be other things then um, like homework and exams and stuff that'll be due on specific dates. But typically that for that then there's there's, there's a window like if it's an exam you'll have any time from noon to midnight then. Um, to take the exam that day. So again, it's, it's an asynchronous format course. And I guess the real thing to watch out for with something like this then is it's super easy to fall behind in a class like this. Because, um, you know, if, if you're working or something and you can't make the, the regular lecture time then and you're like, well, I'll watch these things at night, um, you know, they're, they're a couple hours each. That's, that's a commitment of your time. You say, all right, well, you know, I'll, I'll watch two tomorrow. Or, or maybe I'll just let I'll, I'll let three of them pile up, and the next thing you know, you're looking at six hours of recordings you have to watch. And to make it even worse, though, this is summer. We're cramming an entire semester then into five weeks. So really, every one of these lectures is about a week's worth of material if you were taking the class then during the regular regular semester. So you say, all right, you know, I'll, I'll skip a three lectures. Boom, you're three weeks behind. You're almost a month behind then in the material if you were taking sort of a regular class. So that's just 
be careful of that. It's very, very dangerous. So to, to sort of nudge you a little bit in the direction of keeping up, then um, what I'm going to do then is there are about seven sort of homework assignments, which are really just a little as you learn quizzes over the over the lecture material. They aren't hard quizzes. Um, they're just sort of little, you know, which planet is the third from the sun type questions and just to, just to keep you keep you up to date to make sure um, that you're watching the, the lectures. And so typically there'll be two uh, two recordings and then a quiz then over those two recordings and then the two recordings and another quiz over that. I got a calendar that shows what when all of this is happening then uh, that, that we'll get to then. Um, so that's, that's just to keep you uh, just to keep you up to date. Um, there's other stuff in the syllabus sort of boilerplate stuff about cheating and dis disrespectful behavior um, for technology. It's assumed then that you have a, a computer and some sort of an internet connection then uh, to take this course. Um, I really super strongly suggest a calculator. Um, well, you're going to need one and, and really a real calculator, not your phone. And I know your phone has a calculator in it. Everybody's phone has a calculator in it. But I, this is just years of experience speaking, and including experience with myself, when I tend to do math on my calculator, you know, my phone app on my calculator, for some reason, 50-50 uh, shot whether I've got the right answer. And I've never quite been able to figure out why. I think some of it is, is you're just pressing buttons on that phone screen and there's no tactile feedback. So maybe you think you pressed a five, but you actually pressed a, I don't know, a four or something like that. Or you, you thought you pressed multiply and you accidentally pressed divide. You don't get any sort of feedback for that. And so at least for me with my phone, it's 50-50 whether or not it's going to spit out the right answer. That and doing other things like scientific notation. It's just weird on the phone. So I think, I think you'll find yourself doing better in the class or having maybe less problem, problems with doing any math than um, if you have a real calculator. And you don't need a fancy graphing calculator that can do calculus and all of that stuff. Just a simple, basic, less than $10 scientific calculator will do the job. What you really want to look for, though, is whether or not it can do a scientific notation, because there is some of that then, uh, in this class. All right, so uh, the grading then, uh, all right. So <clears throat> assignments will be posted on As You Learn and the grades then, uh, there's a grade book on As You Learn, the grades will be posted then in the grade book on As You Learn. But um, what do we wanna say about that? that? That's really just a place for you to check your grade and make sure that what you got corresponds with what I think you got and that there are no, uh, what do you wanna say, no, no surprises there. <clears throat> but with the, with the As You Learn grade book, then um, the actual grade calculation I sort of do myself outside of As You Learn on my own sort of spreadsheet then, and, and I'll post then the final grade um, that way. Um, speaking of the final grade then, what makes up your grade in this class? We've got the homework assignments. There'll be, again, about seven of them then, just to keep you up with, with lecture then, just very simple, basic questions, just making sure you're going through the, the, the videos and watching the, the lectures. I've got the dates then of these homeworks then, again, on the calendar. There's a laboratory component of this course then that's 20% of your grade. The first lab then will be on As You Learn at 8 p.m. tonight. And again, I'll also be there on Zoom if you have questions about that lab. Um, <clears throat> and that then makes up 20% of the of the overall grade. And I know it's kind of weird. The lab is actually treated as a separate course during the regular term. Um, you know, you can take one section of lecture and then all these different lab sections. Here, it's the summer. You got one lecture, you got one lab. But it's still, it's got it on its own syllabus and its own answer learn page uh, and things like that. The thing to super keep aware of, though, is in the lab, your, your lowest lab is dropped, so if you miss a lab, then you get a zero, that gets dropped, no big deal. You're allowed to miss a lab uh, with, without any consequences. If you miss the second lab, fine, you get a zero for that. It gets factored into your lab grade, which then makes up 20% of your overall grade. But it's the third lab. If you miss the third lab, uh, what will happen then is you'll get an F for the lab and you'll get an F for the course. You cannot miss more than two labs and pass this course. And the reason we do this is this counts then towards you, you know, your general education, basically lab science course. And if you just do the math, you go, oh, wait a minute, if 20% of my, my grade is lab, yeah. Well, I can maybe not go to any labs, take the 20% zero. If I do well on the tests and the homeworks, I can still walk out of this with a C, maybe even a high C, 
maybe even a low B, depending on the grading scale, without doing a single lab. And that, that sort of defeats them, the whole purpose of gen ed and the, the gen ed sort of science lab thing that we want you to do. And also, though, you know, astronomy, it's a weird thing to think about astronomy then as, as sort of a, a lab science, because it's not chemistry. If this were chemistry, you'd have little test tubes and things that change color and there'd be smoke maybe and stuff. And, and, and this is different because in chemistry, you know, that's all right there on your desk. Or if you were taking a biology course, you'd have a flower there that you could look at and see how, how the, you know, how the flower, how the reproductive system of the flower works by just sort of looking at it. You've got then um, the, the, the stuff right there on the table. Or if this were a geology course, I'd have a whole table full of rocks up in front of me. Oh, this is a sedimentary rock. You know, I have them pretty much for the most part. I'd have the stuff right there in front of me. And astronomy is different in that regard then, because the things that we study are incredibly distant, very, very far away. And, and it's not like I can take a meat thermometer the size of a planet and jam it into the size of the sun or side of the sun and measure the sun's temperature. And so in astronomy, it's, it's really very rare that, that we actually have the things that we're looking at, the things that we're investigating on a table in front of us. Maybe the only big exception for that then would be meteorites. And we've got to little bits of comets that we recovered then from, from within the solar system, or maybe moon rocks or something like that. But for the most part, if, you know, if I want to talk about a black hole, I do not want one of those in the lab with me. And so it's very, very different, but it, it still is a lab science. And it's important that you see this process of collecting data and making a hypothesis, a theory, and then taking that data, going back and say, well, if this is really what's going on, what else should I see? And can I get other observations to conform or uh, confirm this? And the whole scientific method thing. So, so it's important. And so we want you to do the labs. Hence the rule where you can only miss two labs. If you miss the third, you'll get um, an F for the course. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions about it, let me know. And the last component of your grade 10 course are the, are the exams themselves. There will be three of them then, about 75 minutes, or I write them for 75 minutes. <coughs> um, given during the, the term then. Um, again, the dates are on the calendar. And again, they're just simple multiple choice, usually about 50 multiple choice uh, questions. And, and again, you'll have a window then to take the exam, sort of from, from noon to midnight on exam day. Um, you can go and, uh, and take the exam. And notice though, because you've got, you know, basically a six hour window to take the exam, there aren't any makeups, makeup exams. And uh, you have to take the exams um, and unless you have a, an excuse then that's uh, some sort of a university sponsored sports activity or something like that. These are covered then in 6.3.2 of the attendance policy then. Um, but most of well, these absences then you tend to know about them in advance. And if you do know you're going to have an absence um, and miss an exam, um, <clears throat> just talk to me and, and we can we can work something out. Just, just don't come in like a week later and say, yeah, I missed exam too. Oh, I'm not going to be ready. All right. Making sense? I'm hoping so. All right. Um, the, the other thing then is sort of the grading scale. And this is just a standard, you know, you get this percent, you get that grade, you get that percent, you get that grade. And they're just, your grades then are just rounded to the nearest uh, whole number for that then. <clears throat> All right, a couple other things just really quick to talk about. Um, the course description then. So this is the first course of a two semester uh, sequence then that basically satisfies the gen ed physical science lab requirement. Then this section sort of covers a bit of history, um, <clears throat> some of the underlying sort of, of physics then behind astronomy, um, the idea then of light and color and wavelength, things like that, how do telescopes work, things like that. And then finally, then we get into uh, basically the solar system itself. So um, that, that's this course. The second course, the sister course to this, Astronomy 1002, then basically starts off with the sun and then goes out into the, into the universe. And it's all about stars and galaxies and, and the universe itself. And the expected outcomes of this course, then, you can read them yourself. I can read them to you. Students in this course will demonstrate the ability to measure, record, analyze, and classify scientific data. This includes the use of graphs, scientific notation, units, and dimensions, and the application of basic math to real world problems. And then sort of the second sort of student outcome then, students in this course will develop and apply basic principles of physics to better understand uh, through direct observation and other sources the nature of our solar system and the bodies within it. 
<coughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, if you're in a special accommodation system then, uh, situation, we've got the Office of Disability Resources that you can contact and we'll work together uh, to sort something out for you. We've got also then a whole bunch of stuff that the university uh, likes us to put in this syllabus or at least a link to it in the syllabus. And this is all about the uh, attendance policy, student engagement, integrity code, all sorts of stuff. But just follow this link then if you'd like to read then the official uh, attendance policy. Uh, for the university. All right, finally, the last thing then, this is the schedule of what I think is going to happen every day over the next five weeks in this course. So basically, you know, today then, welcome, we'll talk about the distance scale, uh, constellations, and the magnitude systems. And tomorrow then, the celestial sphere, motion, angular size, and the ecliptic. And then on Wednesday, the first homework assignment is, is going to be due then. And again, it'll just be a a simple as you learn quiz, just like, uh, I don't know, probably about 15, 20 questions or so, multiple choice. You'll have from noon to midnight to take it. And it's just going to cover stuff that we talked about then on those first two days. And then on, uh, we've got Memorial Day next Monday, but then on, uh, on Tuesday, June 1st, then will be the first exam covering this material. And also then that, that uh, sort of first homework. Uh, basically covering the stuff then from these two lectures. And then there's the next homework here, covering the stuff from these two lectures and so on. So uh, hopefully this will make sense. Notice though that, you know, exam one, exam two, and then down here on, the, on June 24th, then exam three, we're going pretty fast in this class. So uh, seat belts on, tray tables up, and uh, let's get going. Any questions about this? To the people who've tuned in, any questions, anything, ask me anything about the syllabus. Oh, I, I love it when I make perfect sense. Okay, uh, let us get back. Uh, oh, yes, there is a question. Excellent. Okay, good. So it's not, oh, I shouldn't say good. So it's not just me. Okay, because I was having my coffee this morning. And I went there, and so just sort of nothing comes up. It's just this thing about, oh, what is it? Some access thing, right? All right, when we're done with this, I'm going to get on the bookstore then, and we'll get this sorted. They've switched to a new rental system, and I think there's still some kinks in it. So excellent. I will get, so thank you for letting me know. That's good. I needed to know that. All right, other questions? See, this is good. All right, so, oh uh, gosh, what to say? I think uh, maybe, I almost sort of, I like starting out then sort of with this, this cartoon. I don't know if you can read it or not. Um, let me turn the lights down a little bit. Oh, that's changing the color. All right, I'll turn the lights back down a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's basically, you know, welcome to basic astronomy. Before we start, are there any questions? And everybody's all excited. And, yeah, what makes astronomy different from astrology? And it, uh, lots and lots of math. And then he's basically got an empty classroom. And I just want you to know sort of up front, um, if you notice the department that this course is taught in, it's the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And physics and astronomy sort of go hand in hand. Uh, there are people like me who will argue that astronomy is actually the first physics that people started um, thinking about. And, and that's because astronomy then, the whole thing behind astronomy is trying to figure out what's going on up there, right? Are there other planets? And the answer is yes, uh, around other stars even. And do those planets have life? And trying to answer that question. Or how do stars work? How, do they, how, are, they, how are they born? How are they dying? What are, what are they doing there? And the whole Milky Way, this whole galaxy, what is that doing there? Where did it come from? And the universe itself, what, what was the origin of the universe? How did all this stuff come to be? And trying to figure all of that out just by, by, just by sitting here on Earth. And, 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 that, and that's what's so interesting, at least to me, is how do, you, how do you figure this stuff out from sitting here on Earth where you can't go out and you can't, you can't really touch stuff. And you can't really go, I talked about this a couple of minutes ago, I can't really go and bring a piece of a star here to the Earth and, and you know, study it. So how do you figure this out? And, and the way to do it, though, is to walk around here on the Earth and to look around and to understand what we see here on the Earth and how it works, the physics of how it works, 
and then try and apply that then to what we see out there in the cosmos. And like the perfect, super simple example of this that I don't know if you ever thought about, but imagine, you know, taking just a piece of metal and putting it in a fire and heating it up. And think about, you know, what happens? What do I see? What change do I see in the metal as it heats up? Like a piece of iron. You all maybe seen a, a blacksmith that working. And they heat that piece of iron up and it starts glowing. And it gets hot and it starts glowing and it starts off sort of a dim, dull red. But as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it gets brighter. And not only does it get, get brighter, the temperature, the color changes with the temperature. It starts off a dull red, and then it's sort of maybe if it gets really hot, it's sort of like an orangish red. And if you can get it super hot, we talk about stuff that's blue white hot. And so thinking about something that's giving off light because it's hot, if it's on the cool end of that, it's going to give off sort of a red light. And as you look at something that's hotter and hotter and hotter and glowing because it's hot, when you're in that sort of the really hot end, you're starting to talk about a blue-white light. And this idea then that the color of something glowing because it's hot then, well, that's correlated with its temperature. The hotter it is, the bluer it'll be. And also the hotter it is, the more light it'll give off. And so I can sit around here and you know, look at things on Earth and watch them heat up. And then I can look at the stars. And I notice the stars have different colors. And, and it's a weird thing. And, but if you go out and you really start looking at them carefully, you can look at a star like Antares or Arcturus or something like that. And they're sort of a, like a reddish orange. And then you go look at a star like Sirius or Vega, and they're blue. They're sort of a blue-white color. So what do you think that's telling you? Turns out it's telling you that stars have different temperatures. And the cooler they are, the redder they are, the hotter they are, the more blue-white they are. And looking, though, at the color of the star and starting to talk about that, how hot that star is. And here you go. That's the connection, then, between what we're seeing here on Earth and trying to figure out stuff in the sky. But I also don't want to be able to do more than just say, oh, it's a bluish star. Or, oh, it's a reddish star. And I want to, be, to, to better connect, then, those colors to actual temperatures. And what, I'll, what, I'll, what we're going to end up using for that, then, of course, is math. And because math, then, it's just, a, it's just describing relationships between quantities. There's a relationship between temperature and color. And I can express that, that, that relationship, then, very, very accurately doing math. Or if you talk to physicists, then, and astronomers, then, we talk about you know, the language of nature, the language of our universe, the language of the physical world around us, then, is math. If I hit a baseball then and I ignore the atmosphere, um, it's going to follow then a parabolic trajectory. It's just going to be described as you know, so, something to the second power, time to the second power, something like that. And that describes how it's moving. And because there's this relationship then between math and physical quantities and what's going on in the universe, there will be some math in this course. And now that I've scared the heck out of you, um, the math isn't bad. Um, it's basic. It's really just sort of basic al basic high school algebra. There won't even be any quadratic equations or anything like that. There'll be like some ratios and stuff over stuff, maybe a few things like that. The weirdest thing you'll ever see then is that the brightness of an object then depends on its temperature to the fourth power. And that's the weirdest math then that I think we see in this course. But I just, I want to be up front with you then and just, you know, that, that there will be there will be some of that in this course. And hopefully, though, everybody is okay with that. And I know some people have sort of a math anxiety and a math phobia um, because it really was a form of torture in high school. I remember not liking my high school math very much um, and going, oh, whatever will I use this for? This is stupid. Well, a little bit I know I'd be doing this. Um, but, but if you want to talk about math and you have problems with it or just don't like it, you know, come see me. Come talk to me about that. We can, we can, we can worry about that. All right. So, well, let's let's start off then. Um, maybe with, with looking at the, the you know, look at what, where to even begin in a course like this. And so, oh gosh, where to begin? Well, maybe the best place to begin then is maybe just sort of a a, a look at the universe. Maybe we should just sort of take a look at everything. And, and, and sort of sort of see what's going on with it and, and maybe sort of look at this whole idea of the universe and, and you know where we are in it, our place in it, and just get a sense of scale and the sizes of things and where we fit then um, in all of this. And maybe talk about you know sort of our home and then just sort of zoom out and see sort of you know, 
well, where we fit in all this. And you can start off, though, um, with maybe just something at least I know. And if you're here on campus or have been on campus, then, yeah, this is Boone. And there's campus. Oh, and there's Garwood then. That's uh, that's where my office is. My house is actually down here. I like this picture because my house is in this picture. But there we go. That's maybe a, a place to start off then. That's Boone. And, and you, you go, all right, well, you know, that's Boone. Couple miles across here, you could you could really pretty easily walk it. Um, it's an example then of a city, and and you think about North Carolina. Then um, there are about 500 cities or so then um, in North Carolina. And this is just one example then of these 500 cities then, a couple miles across, something like that. Um, well, okay, well, we can zoom out from this set. And instead of just talking about our, our location then here in Boone, maybe think about our location in North Carolina. So we're just zooming out then. Here's the, the state of North Carolina. If you look at the size now, you know, instead of just a few miles across, like the previous picture, now we're talking about 500 miles across. Here's Boone. And, and you have a feel for that sort of a size, though. And, and you, you know, have you ever driven, like, from Boone to the beach? or from the, the beach to the mountains, I'm, I'm sure some of you have. And so, you know, how long does that drive take? And, and sometimes it's interesting to express distances in terms of drive time. But if, if you think about it, what, it's like a six, seven, eight hour drive uh, to get to the beach here from Boone. Well, why is it six, seven, or eight hours though? Why isn't it just, you know, 7.2 hours, something like that? And I guess, I guess part of that then, well, it depends really on where you're going. Are, are you going down here to Wilmington? Or are you going up to, up to the, the beach up here, you know, old, old Virginia Beach up there? Um, and also, though, it depends on your speed, how fast you're driving, uh, because, you know, the, the you know, gosh, speed is just distance and time, distance divided by time. So your time is basically going to be your distance divided by your speed. Well, the faster you're going then, the, the shorter the time is going to be. So... All right, so I guess you have to worry about that a little bit. But the basic idea is it's you know, six to eight hours. Go from Boone to the beach, about 500 miles across. And okay, that's North Carolina. And well, North Carolina then is just one example of, uh, oh, maybe 48 or so states then that, that make up then the sort of continental United States. Yes, there's Alaska and Hawaii though, but sort of just pulling out, you know, here's, here's us and here's Boone, here's North Carolina, we're pulling out. So instead of 500 miles across then, now we're talking, hey, where to go? There we go. Now we're talking about 3,000 or so miles across for the United States. And again, you can talk about, you know, have you ever driven from, from one coast to the other? And, and you know, how long does, how long does that take? And again, it depends on your speed, and it depends, you know, are you going from the southern Florida to Seattle, or are you just going across in the fastest possible, sort of shortest route? It depends on how fast you're going, but it'll take you a few days to go from one side of the United States to the other um, in a drive. Um, well, actually, though, the record is, is 27 hours to go from one coast to the other. It was a relatively recent cannonball run. And if you do the math on that, though, if you get bored, you can actually do this math. Basically, 3,000 miles in 27 hours. So if you wanted to figure out how long that took, you got 3,000 miles, and you divide it by the time. Distance divided by time is speed, like miles per hour. So 3,000 uh, miles divided by 27 hours, that's an average of about 110 miles per hour then, uh, during that trip, which... Uh, uh, yeah, it's very illegal. Don't do that. Um, anyway, so uh, but, uh, thinking about this, we started off, though, with just a little city, and we zoomed out, and we talked about you know, one of 500 cities in our state. We looked at our state then. That's one of 50, or sorry, 48 states then in the con continental United States. And we could, we could zoom out a little further and talk about you know, how many countries there are on the, the continent then, or we could talk about the oceans and you know, how many oceans there are. But let's just pull out and have a look then at the whole darn thing. And so here we are. This is Earth. This is where you keep all your stuff. Um, and here is the United States, and there's sort of North Carolina, and there's Boone. Um, but you know, all of the 500, 500 cities then in the 48 states in the con or in the in the country then that's on the continent that's part of the part of the Earth then. Um, again, just sort of zooming out though, and looking then at these, these sort of bigger and bigger structures. Structures, and now we're talking about something that's about 25,000 miles in circumference. 
And so if you were to get in your car and try and drive all the way around the Earth, which I know is challenging because of the oceans, you actually really can't do it. But you can imagine maybe something was starting in southern, uh, southern uh, uh, South America and driving up through uh, Chile and then going through uh, the Panama then in Mexico, driving through the United States, on up into Canada, and then up into way into the northern territories. Yay! You could get pretty close to the circumference of the Earth. But if you think how long that would take, if you just if you didn't make you drive 60 miles an hour then, and you don't stop to go completely around the Earth, then it would take you about 17 days of continuous drive. And, and so, but there we are. There's sort of where we are then on our home planet with with Boone and North Carolina and the United States and North America and the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. There we are then uh, there on the Earth. All right. What if we wanted to zoom out further? Let's go, let's take this picture then and go even bigger than this. So uh, what would our next step be? And I'd say, well, our next step then would be to zoom out even further and to look then at the solar system and to think about the solar system. And believe me, we're gonna talk about that, uh, this term, but you know, thinking about the solar system at the very, very center of our solar system is the sun. It's by far the dominant object in our solar system. It's 99% of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. Everything else in the solar system then is like one one hundredth of the mass of the sun. And everything in the solar system then actually goes around the sun. It revolves around the sun. All the planets then, the Earth being one of them, going around the sun. And we'll see later a weird thing though. If you've got the sun and the planets going around the sun, they're all going around the sun in the same direction and in the same plane almost like they all form together. Um, that We'll talk about this later. But, and so you've got then the eight planets then going around the sun. And, and this is something that always comes up because I said eight planets. And you know I'm a little bit older. I grew up with nine planets in our solar system because Pluto then was considered a planet back when I was a kid studying astronomy. Um, but in 2006 then, um, astronomers decided that they weren't going to call Pluto a planet anymore. And there are very, very good reasons for this, which I very strongly agree with. It was the correct choice, because if you look at Pluto, its orbit is a little bit weird, and its composition is a little bit weird compared to the other planets. And there's just a lot of stuff with Pluto that doesn't jive with the other planets in the system. But it is much more consistent with some of the other sort of balls of rock and ice that we find out there in the cheap seats of the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. And it's an example then of what we're going to call a minor planet. But looking then at the solar system, yes, there's the sun and there's the nine, or did it, there's the eight planets. See, I grew up with it. I keep wanting to say nine. Still, years later, um, there are the eight planets. And, but there's also stuff like asteroids and comets and these small icy bodies out there then beyond the orbit of Neptune, all also orbiting the sun, all also part of the solar system. And so we can zoom out, though, and look at our place in all of that. And so here we are zooming out a little bit further then. And here's the sun. And this then is the orbit of Mercury. This is the orbit of Venus. And then here's the orbit of the Earth then. And we can think about what this distance actually is. It turns out, on average then, it's about 93 million miles, uh, the distance then between the sun and the Earth. And we can compare that with the circumference of the Earth, where we just talked about that, 25,000 miles. Our distance then from the sun to the earth, though, 93 million miles. That's an incredible distance, it seems, then, that, that we are from the sun. And you can compare, then, the size of the earth to the sun. And so here's the here's sort of a, you know, an artist's rendering. You know, here's the sun. And this little tiny point here, which you can probably barely see, that's the earth, then, compared, uh, compared to the sun. And, and looking at it, then, you can fit, oh, what is the number? Oh, I've lost my cursor. There we go. Uh, I've got the number here. Uh, oh yeah, you can fit 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. That gives you some idea then of the size of the sun compared to the Earth. And that's why we consider it then sort of the, the anchor then um, of our solar system. And there we are then 93 million miles away. And we start to start to run into to, to trouble here though um, with, our, with, our, with our units. I mean, we can talk about them um, you know, the, the distance from the sun, and I can measure it in miles, in 93 million miles. That's a big number uh, to, to start to write down. And it's, it's a lot like, um, well, gosh, why didn't I talk about the, the I don't know, the, the size of Boone then? Why didn't I talk about the, the size of Boone in feet? 
instead of just saying it's a few miles, I could have said, oh, you know, it's about 20,000, 30,000 feet across, something like that, knowing that there's 5,280 in a mile. Um, why did why did I what I why did I use miles instead of feet? And, and you could go well because it's a more convenient unit. You're talking about something city sized. I want to use a unit then that's more appropriate for measuring something that's the size of cities. If I wanted to measure, um, I don't know, like my height. Yeah, sure. I maybe want to use feet for that. I don't want to measure my height in miles. That would be silly. But I don't want to measure the size of Boone in feet. Uh, I want to use a more appropriate unit. And, and we start to run into this then in astronomy too, where all of a sudden then our, our distances, our sizes become so big that we're going to want to stop using miles. Although technically we're going to use kilometers because we use the metric system, just like almost the entire planet, with the exception of the United States. And I think, I think Libya and maybe one other country then um, don't use the metric system. So uh, anyways, what we'll start to do, though, is take some of these larger units then and basically just um, their larger distances and come up with units then that are maybe more appropriate. And, and just I just mentioned it because you're actually seeing it here then on this slide. We start talking about, you know, the measuring, measuring the, the distances of planets from the sun, not in terms of miles anymore, but we have a new unit that we're going to end up using then called an astronomical unit. Or an astronomical unit then is one average Earth sun distance. And that's really handy then for talking about the distances of planets from the sun, one astronomical unit. Uh, fine, that's one Earth-Sun distance. I can talk about Venus then, that orbits the sun at a distance of about 0.7 astronomical units. And that tells me then that Venus then, well, if one astronomical unit is one Earth-Sun distance and Venus is at 0.7 Earth-Sun Earth astronomical units or 0.7 Earth-Sun distances, that's just telling me Venus orbits the sun at about 70% the distance that the Earth does. Or I could go, oh, look, it's Jupiter. It's 5.2 astronomical units from the sun. That's telling you, well, Jupiter orbits at about 5.2 times further from the sun than the Earth does. Or Neptune then, out at 30 astronomical units. So it's just a, a more convenient unit then for measuring uh, these sorts of distances. And as they come up then, uh, I'll, I'll continue to uh, measure or uh, mention them. So, but this gives you some sense maybe of the scale of at least the inner part of the solar system where we are with Venus and Mercury and also Mars is a little bit further out then too. We can continue though uh, moving, in. oh yeah, uh, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting I have slides. So yes, one astronomical unit then, that's the average Earth-Sun distance. We can keep zooming out though, and now we've zoomed out. Everything that was in that previous slide is in a little tiny red box here then um, surrounding this, this dot then that's the Sun. And so right here at the center then, that's the sun, that's Mercury, Venus, and Earth, all of us that are in this little tiny box. It's just a few pixels across at the center. Here's the orbit of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, then moving further and further away from the sun. And we're out here then at the orbit of Neptune then. This is about 30 astronomical units then away from the sun, or 30 times further away from the sun then, uh, than the Earth orbits. And But there we go. This is primarily sort of what we... Think about as the solar system, basically the sun and the planets then going around it. And you might ask yourself then, well, what is the, the edge of the solar system? How big actually is our solar system? And it, it's tempting to just say, all right, well, the solar system stops here at Neptune. But you know that's not true because I just talked about it a little while ago. You, you got Pluto then and these icy objects then out here beyond the orbit of Neptune. And... <clears throat> It's really actually a surprisingly difficult problem to answer is really how big our solar system is because you get out here and you've got small pieces of debris that are part of the solar system that are orbiting the sun, but they tend to be very, very small and dark. They don't reflect a lot of light. They're extraordinarily difficult to see. You know, the largest telescopes in the, on the planet have trouble seeing the stuff out here and trying to figure out that um, where, where it actually ends. And <clears throat> There, there are sort of arguments then where, where the actual edge is actually thousands of astronomical units. You know, this is 30 astronomical units. The actual edge is, is way out here, thousands of astronomical units away from the sun. Sort of where the, where the sun's gravitational influence then is finally uh, so low that it's negligible. So the solar system then actually really, really bigger than we probably usually think of it, at least, at least before taking this class.
Zoom out even further though. There's the sun, there's the solar system, there's us and everything. We can zoom out further and, okay, nothing. It turns out then that space is really, really empty. The distance then between stars and space then is really almost sort of sort of incomprehensibly large. And you can you can talk about zooming out, and, and here's the sun, and, and there it is by itself. The size of this box then, oh gosh, what do you want to say about that? The size of this box is one light year across. And I guess I need to talk about that unit. Because now we're talking about the distances between stars. Miles is a very, very silly unit to use for the distances between stars. And even astronomical units, 93 million miles, is not a good unit to start talking about then the distances between stars. And so the next sort of unit, as we're going to larger and larger units, bigger and bigger scales then, uh, would be the light year. And so thinking about then this idea of the light year, um, uh, maybe I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have already seen this then, this idea of the light year. It's a unit of distance, and it's really a measure then of how far light travels in one year. And you think about, oh gosh, I mean, I don't, I usually don't think about um, in, in my day-to-day -day life this idea that light has a, has a finite speed to it. I throw that light switch, boom, that light's on, that light is striking my eyes effectively instantaneously. And, and the reason for that is that light travels really, 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 really fast. You know, you can talk about its speed then 300,000 kilometers per second or about 183,000 miles per second then. This, sorry, 186,000 miles per second then. The speed of light, it's moving 186,000 miles uh, per second. And so, yeah, the distance between that light and my eye when I throw the light switch, yeah, it doesn't take the, lot, the light going 186,000 miles per second. It doesn't take it a long time to reach my eye. But on these larger scales, it does start to, it does start to take some time. Um, a good example of this that you really don't think of is if you go back and watch the Apollo footage and you listen to the communications between the astronauts on the moon and Houston, there's always a, a delay of a couple of seconds. And that's because the moon is actually, you know, a couple of, uh, uh, what is it, about three quarters of a light second away or about a light second away. And so there's a delay then for the radio waves to get from the Earth to the moon, the astronauts to respond, and then for that light, that, that, those radio waves moving at the speed of light to get back to the Earth. And that's just a couple seconds. If you think about the sun, 93 million miles away, and you think about that, well, how long does it, does it take the light to get to us then from the sun? It's about eight minutes. And so, you know, the sun emitting light, that light, 93 million miles, it takes that light about eight minutes then to reach us here on the Earth. And, and you go even further than that, though, and you start talking about these distances then um, between stars and measuring then these distances then in terms of how the light year then, the distance then that light travels uh, basically in one year. And so looking at it then, one light year, I know this is on the bottom, I don't know if you can see it or not then, um, it's about 9.5 times 10 to the 12th, or gosh, what is that, 9, what, about 9,500 trillion kilometers then, or about 6 trillion miles, or about 63,000 astronomical units then, is basically a light year. And, but when you're talking about then the distances between stars, even one light year then, you're talking about, you know, this, this box that being 6 trillion miles across, there's still, if the sun's at the center, there's still not another star in this box. The distances then <clears throat> between the two stars are just basically extraordinary. And we can pull out a little bit further though, and, and you know, finally, if you start to talk about a box then that's maybe, oh, I don't know, about 20 light years across, so uh, you finally you know, get a, a, few, a few stars um, in that box. Maybe, maybe we should talk about that, the closest star to the Earth then, and it's Proxima Centauri. And it's about 4.2 um, light years away from the sun. So 4.2 light years, 265,000 astronomical units. And really, which is easier to remember, 4.2 light years or 26,000 uh, 265,000 astronomical units, or gosh, 2,500,000 trillion miles? Ah, 4.2 light years then. Um, and so there we go. The distance then, 4.2 light years, 256,000 astronomical units, or 2.5 times 10 to the 13th 
um, miles in. And that's the nearest star to us. It's actually part of a triple system then, uh, Alpha Centauri and what is it? Alpha Centauri, uh, A and B then, and Proxima Centauri. So Al Alpha Centauri then is actually two stars, A and B going around each other. And Proxima Centauri is a third star that's gravitationally bound then to those two stars. You'll learn more about that uh, uh, next semester. I just want to take, take a second then and actually show you um, on the night sky of uh, where this is. And so this is the constellation then Centaurus, the centaur. Here is Alpha Centauri, which is actually two stars. And in this little sort of um, uh, um, box here then, um, that's, Alpha, that's uh, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us. And I, I, I don't know if it will matter or not. It's probably not going to matter. I can try and turn down the lights even further. And, um, well, I can just jump to the chase here. If you look, there's actually no star in this box. Ah! And that's not me trying to trick you. It, it, the idea, then, is this star, Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to us, then, is, um, gosh, what do we want to say? It's about 250 times fainter than the limit to what your eye can actually see. So it's 250 times fainter than what your eye can see. And yet it's the nearest star to us. And so what does that tell you? We've got the nearest star to us then, I got the lights up too high now. The nearest star to us then is so faint in our sky, you can't even see it without a telescope. And that's the nearest star to us. We've got all these other stars you can see just fine, but what's up with that star? What does that tell you then? about that star. It's so close yet we still can't see it. If you think about it then that must be because that star, that star must not be putting out an awful lot of light. Or this idea that stars are like light bulbs and you can have a high wattage light bulb that's putting out a ton of light that you can see for a great distance and then you've got the low wattage light bulbs like maybe, I don't know, the one that goes in your oven or something like that that's very very dim and doesn't put out a lot of light. And so Proxima Centauri here then, even though it's the closest star to us, we can't see it without a telescope, but it's because it's putting out hardly any light. And it's an example then of a class of star. It's actually the most common class of star. It's called a red dwarf. And, and that name should tell you a lot, red, which means then it's going to be cool and not putting out a lot of light because the hotter something is, the more light it puts out. So this is cool, so it's not putting out a lot of light. And dwarf, it's also a very, very small star. So not only is it, is it cool and not putting out a lot of light, it's also small, so it's not putting out a lot of light. It's the double whammy. And so Proxima Centauri there is just an example then of one of these red dwarfs. Anyways, I just want to have that in the back of your head. I'm just sort of previewing stuff that, that we're, we're going to talk about. But we can pull out even further then. We can talk about the solar neighborhood then, the, the stars then that are within a few thousand light years of, uh, of us then our solar neighborhood. Pulling out even further though, we see the sun as part of a much, 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 much larger structure of stars that we, we basically sort of call a galaxy. And our galaxy then is referred to as the Milky Way galaxy. When you go out at night and it's nice and dark and you're away from the city, like you're up here at Boone, you just drive a little bit in any direction, get away from the city lights and look out on a good moonless, cloudless night, you'll see the Milky Way in that, the star then, that, that sort of fuzzy, glowy band. And, and what you're seeing though are, are just thousands and thousands and thousands of very distant, unresolved stars that all sort of, the light all sort of mixes together and it just looks sort of like this glowing band in the sky, almost like somebody spilled milk across the sky, hence the name the Milky Way Galaxy. And this is the view from above, and again this is more stuff for sort of astronomy too, but there we are, here's the center of the galaxy, here we are um, sort of out here in the outer reaches of the galaxy, um, and, and but there we are, we're just one star looking at this then, um, you're starting to talk about maybe a few hundred billion stars in the Milky Way, maybe about 300 billion stars or so. And we start to look at the size of the Milky Way then, and we start to measure its distance or its size here. These are, you know, 45,000, 60,000 light years, 70,000 light years. It's about, um, from the center out then, it's about 100,000, uh, almost 100,000 light years. Um, uh, what do I want to say? No, it's only about 100,000 light years then, um, in diameter. Absolutely huge, and we're just part of this large structure then. It's this, it's this galaxy with, with billions and billions then um, of other stars. Oh, uh oh, that's not good.
Hold on. Come on. There we go. Um, so that then uh, is, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, no. So, oh, so the and for those of you who are watching the recording, somebody asked me if this was this actually is recording. It's a it's it's a it's a weird system then where the recording then is happening then on a on a different computer, and so you're seeing the Zoom thing. For those of you who've tuned in, you're seeing the usual Zoom thing, but the recording then is actually being done on a separate computer. Um, so no, but excellent question, and thank you for pointing that out because I would have been terribly disappointed if I forgot to press record. <laughs> Okay. Um, oh, so I forgot. Uh, so yeah. So this is basically, um, you know, the, the whole idea though. Sitting here, and you're embedded in this Milky Way galaxy. You know, it, it's a thin disk. And so what you're looking at in the sky, that this is basically the disk of the Milky Way. There we are. You're, you're basically in this disk, looking at it. Then, and this is what it looks like then, uh, from, from here on Earth. And this idea of, of you know the Milky Way and our, our place in it. Maybe one thing to ask though is. Um, is this really a, is this an actual picture of the Milky Way as seen from above? And it, it's sort of something you have to start being aware of or asking yourself in astronomy when you start seeing images, especially these days, is, you know, you almost have to read the captions and look at them and think about them a little bit. Are you seeing something then that's an artist's rendering or a computer generated image, or are you seeing then an actual photograph of the object? And it can get tricky. Um, of course, looking at this, uh, this isn't an actual image of the Milky Way, because think about the scales here. We're talking about this being 100,000 light years across. To take this picture of the Milky Way from above, we would have had to send some, you know, send some space probe out then a few, oh, at least, at least 10,000 light years, something like that, in order to take this picture. And there's no way we could have gotten anything out that far away from the Milky Way then uh, to take a picture like this. The furthest, uh, the furthest human-made objects then um, from the sun right now are, of course, the Voyager probes, and they're just leaving. Uh, they're just leaving the actual sort of boundary then of the Earth's, Earth, sorry, the sun's magnetic field as we speak. I mean, they're really just leaving the edge of the solar system right now, even though they were launched way back in the 70s. And so, yeah, no, this is an artist's rendering then of what we think the Milky Way galaxy would look like from above based on all the data uh, we have to date then. And so, yes, this is an artist's impression uh, uh, sort of right here. All right, uh, okay. All right, so yes, a few hundred billion stars. Oh, I gotta remember my slides. I do this all the time. Yep, so there's the scale that 100,000 light years, few hundred billion stars in, um, in the Milky Way. We can pull out even further than this though. So, so we've got this idea of our planet is just going around the sun. The sun is a star then going around the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just a, a galaxy. And you can go out then and you can find then other galaxies. And if you look at how the galaxies are distributed in the universe, they're actually sort of clumped into clusters, which makes sense because this is all a gravity deal, right? I mean, we've got the Earth's gravity holding us here to the floor. The sun's gravity then is holding the Earth in orbit around the sun. The, the gravity of the Milky Way then is holding the sun in orbit around the Milky Way. Well, the Milky Way is a few hundred billion stars. All of those stars have mass. With that mass comes gravity. The Milky Way has gravity. Other galaxies being made up of matter and stars, they have galaxy, they, or they have mass, they gravitationally attract each other. And so you go out and you find then most of the galaxies distributed then um, in clusters. And these clusters can, can contain hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Most of what you're seeing in this picture then is actually a galaxy. And if you think about, well, most of these galaxies, then they're, they're made up of hundreds of billions of stars. And so I'm seeing a few hundred galaxies of a few hundred billion stars each. This is the Perseus galaxy cluster. And you start to go, oh, goodness. And you can even look then at the clusters of galaxies, which are also clustered. So you've got clusters of clusters of galaxies. These are referred to then as superclusters. So this idea of galaxy uh, superclusters. And this is our local supercluster then. It's about 160 Oh uh, gosh, this is another unit that we'll get into in astronomy too, uh, megaparsecs, which is about 3.26 light years. And so this is about 400 million light years across then 
our sort of local galaxy supercluster. And these white lines then are basically their, their velocity vectors. They're showing then how the, the clusters of galaxies within the supercluster of galaxies that are, are actually moving. And so it's a weird thing to think about though, but, but you know, we've got the Milky Way then, it's part of a cluster of galaxies, which is part of a supercluster of galaxies of about 100,000 galaxies. And you start going, oh my goodness, 100,000 galaxies, each with a few hundred billion stars in it. Um, it just starts to get crazy. You know, and just thinking about the sizes of these things. And you can pull out even further. And you can start talking about then clusters of superclusters of galaxies. And thinking about then, you know, going out and looking at such enormous scales. And thinking about where the galaxies are and where the superclusters of galaxies are. And, and so here, um, uh, and there's no way you can read this, but, but the, the sort of, I don't know what you'd call that, sort of a turquoise um, labels uh, all in through here then. Uh, these are the names then of the different superclusters. But if you look, you know, there are places where there's superclusters clumped up, and then there are also voids where, you're, where, where there aren't any uh, galaxies then. And so, you know, here's the sculptor void in this region here in the universe where there are hardly any galaxies. Compare that then to the sculptor supercluster right there. There are places where you find then a lot of galaxies, places where you find hardly any galaxies. Or this idea then of the distribution of matter in the universe then being relatively filament-like, almost, sort of, almost sort, of, sort of like a Swiss cheese. And, and again, we're, we're looking at super, super large scales here then. Um, and, and these filaments that are hundreds of millions of light years across, made up of these galaxies, each with hundreds and hundreds of billions, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of billions of stars. And you start to think about, gosh, um, what's going on here then? Why does the universe have this sort of filament spider web, wispy Swiss cheese structure to it? What's up with, with this sort of structure? And this, this is actually, um, I should come out and say then this is a computer model of what we think it should look like then on these sorts of scales based on data, based on you know, the, the best data um, to date. And uh, so we think then when you go out and you look in the universe, maybe about 200, 100, 200 billion uh, galaxies out there that are, that are part of the observable universe. So you can go out and look and, you know, there's a few hundred billion galaxies, each with a few hundred billion stars in it. And oh my goodness, those numbers are absolutely huge. The number of stars then, uh, that are in the, the, the observable universe. And at this point, though, your head explodes. And try not to think about this before you go to bed tonight because you won't get any sleep. But, but, you know, the size of what we're talking about and the number of stars in our place in all of this is just incredible to think about that, uh, what's going on with, with all of this. Then. And, and at this point then, I mean, the numbers actually sort of, I hate to say it, I mean, they, they actually sort of get silly when you're talking about hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in them. You, your brain really starts to have trouble with this. But I should mention one other thing though. I talked about the idea of this is, you know, a few hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe. And that's a weird thing. And we got to back up a little bit, though, before we can talk about uh, the, the observable universe and, and this idea of uh, thinking about that, the light travel time. And this is a strange thing to think about, but, but okay, the sun, 93 million miles away, eight light minutes away. And so light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach us. If you stop and think about it, though, that's kind of weird. That means you're seeing the sun eight minutes ago. When you actually look up and see it in the sky, you're seeing what the sun looked like eight minutes ago because that's how long it took the light to reach you. Or I can go look at Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away from us, and I'm seeing light that left Proxima Centauri for us 4.2 years ago. I'm seeing that light just now. I'm seeing Proxima Centauri 4.2 years in the past. I'm, the light is just finally reaching me now. And this idea then, that if I look further and further away, it's taking the light longer and longer to reach me, I'm basically looking back in time and, and thinking about looking at objects then that are not just you know, light years away, but maybe 100,000 light years away, a million light years away, a billion light years away, and looking back further and further and further and seeing them back further and further in the past. And just as an aside, if you want to start thinking about how galaxies got together, 
at the beginning of the, of the universe and how they've evolved over time, one way to do it is to grab your telescope and look at more and more distant galaxies. You're seeing these galaxies further and further back in the past. And what you find then is the galaxies that are very, very far away from us then, maybe ooh, 12 billion light years away, 11 billion light years away, look very, very different from the galaxies that we see around us today, which is telling you a little bit then about how they started out and, and, and you can use that then to sort of reconstruct then how they've evolved over time. It's, it's really weird stuff. But also thinking about that, I'm, I'm looking further and further away. I'm looking for, for farther and farther back in time in astronomy too. I know a lot of this is astronomy too stuff we're starting off with. But in astronomy too, you'll talk about how the universe, and it actually does have a finite age. About 13 billion years ago then, there was the Big Bang. There is a stunning amount of evidence for this that we'll get into in astronomy too. But but you know the the, the universe then has a start date, and, and you know, looking back in time, well, there's a limit to how far back I can look because the universe doesn't. If I wanted to see something 15 billion you know light years or 15 billion years in the past, well, I can't. It did nothing existed 15 billion years ago. So this idea then that there's an actual edge to what we can see. In, in, in our universe, just because there hasn't been enough time for the light to get to us, you know, from, from anything further away. This is all getting very, very weird. But the other thing we'll talk about in astronomy, too, is this idea of the universe actually expanding. And so if I look at something that's 13 billion light years away, it actually left on its way to Earth when the universe was also a lot smaller, and the universe then has actually expanded during that time. And though all of the weirdness combines to this idea that the observable universe and that we can see from here on Earth, it's basically a, almost about 100 billion light years across, about 93 billion light years across. And you can do that, though, with a universe that's only 13 billion years old because of this expansion thing. But that's the basic idea, then. You know, the, the light, then, it takes time to travel to distant places. And, yeah, again, I always forget about my slides. It takes eight minutes to get to us from the sun. Um, and so you're seeing them basically, uh, basically into the past. You're seeing eight minutes into the past with the sun. Um, and you have 4.2 light years for the closest star. There we go. And so this idea then, the Big Bang about 13 billion years ago, um, the light that, that it's from the Big Bang, it's been traveling towards us all of this time. But in that time, um, the, the, the universe itself then has expanded. But there's an edge, the whole idea behind this though is that there's an edge to the visible universe then. Because the light then that was just emitted during the creation of the universe, it's been traveling towards us for 13.8 billion years, but we can't see anything sort of beyond that. Oh, this is all such weird stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's an edge to the universe. It's not like there's a wall here where the universe ends. All this means is anything beyond this is too far away for the light to have gotten to us yet. If you come back tomorrow, you'll see a little bit further. If you come back a little, a little couple days later, you'll see even further. And basically, as time goes on, the light from further and further out in the galaxy, then uh, you get more and more time for that light to get to us. But today, looking around today, then you can only see about 93 billion uh, light years of the universe. That doesn't mean, though, that the universe has an edge. It doesn't, just like it doesn't have a center. And again, this is stuff I, I, I worry about talking about them because you're just going to be like, oh, uh, but, but how can something without a center have an edge and all sorts of weird stuff about how the universe, how can the universe, you know, if the universe is expanding, what's it expanding into? And you can't ask that, though, because this is actual three-dimensional space that's expanding. It's space itself that's getting bigger. It's not expanding into anything. All right. Don't want, to, don't want to get digressed on this. If you'd like to talk about this, though, I've got office hours. We can have all sorts of discussions about this stuff until the point where you just can't sleep anymore. Um, real quick, then, uh, the units of distance, then, that we've been talking about. We've got the astronomical unit, then, which is one Earth-Sun distance, nine or 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles, then. Neptune then 30 astronomical units from the sun. We also then ended up talking about the light year, which is the distance and travel by light in one year, about six trillion miles or so. Uh, I did mention then also the idea of the parsec 3.2, six light years. That's something we'll talk about more, um, maybe a little bit in this class, but that's more something also then um, 
for, uh, for uh, astronomy too. All right. And I got just a couple more slides and then we will take a break. Yeah, it is totally time for a break. Okay. Um, the other thing to think about though, come on. There we go. Um, you know, that was sort of the, the where are we bit of the lecture. We can also think about when we are. And again, you know, the numbers we kick around in this then are, are extraordinary. I mean, you're talking about, you know, billions of galaxies and hundreds of thousands and millions of light years across and, and these sizes and the numbers are huge. Also, though, in terms of time, I mean, it's really hard to think about, you know, 13.8 billion years ago. Uh, I can't even remember last week most of the time. And the whole idea of trying to put 13.8 billion, billion years in my head, well, I don't know how well that's going to work. But maybe one way to look at it, though, is to imagine, well, maybe if we had a calendar and we took the entire lifetime of the universe and we just put it on a calendar, and on what dates then would certain events have taken place? So just take the entire lifetime of the universe to date and put it on a calendar from January 1st to, to New Year's Eve then, December, uh, December 31st at midnight then, where do all these things happen? And so this is just this is just handy to start to think about, you know, this idea, okay, we've got the Big Bang, the universe starts on New Year's Day. By about mid-March, uh, the our Milky Way forms. And so right off the bat then, there are a couple of months then after the Big Bang where our galaxy wasn't here yet. There was stuff going, well, what happened there? Well, more stuff for astronomy too, but we've got our Milky Way forming. And but it's not really till August that the sun and the solar system form. <clears throat> and so thinking about the whole lifetime of the universe, um, the sun and the planets then are, are relative latecomers then. They're, they're forming then sort of in August. Around September then, we've got the, the oldest sort of life forms, known life forms forming here on our, our planet then. The single cell life forms then forming in September. By about November, we've got the first multicellular organisms then, uh, uh, forming here on the Earth. And then looking at December then, um, we've got the, the Cambrian explosion then on December 15th. We've got the first vertebrae showing up then on December 17th. Plants showing up on December 18th. We've got you know, December 20th, the first four limbed animals. And we've got uh, insects then on the, the 21st of December. Oh, the first dinosaurs appearing then on Christmas Eve. If the universe then started on New Year's Day, We've got the first dinosaurs appearing on Christmas Eve. They're basically having a thing. Uh, first mammals then on the 25th. 27th then we've got the first birds. Oh, December 29th. Oh, that asteroid or comet then wipes out all the, the dinosaurs then. Oh. Um, and it's not really till December 31st that we start talking about, you know, at 9.24 p.m. on December 21st, uh, the first human ancestors starting to walk upright. And finally, you're talking about um, building the pyramids then. Uh, basically about 10 seconds before midnight then, um, we're building our periods before midnight then on December 31st. One second before uh, December 31st and New Year's then, one second uh, we've got then um, basically the, the Europeans discovering um, North and South America. One second before midnight. And so to sort of put it all in perspective then in terms of the age of the universe, yeah, we're in like the, the, the last couple of minutes um, uh, of the thing then. And think about then just in terms of um, a human lifespan then is about uh, 16 hundredths of a second in, in the whole history of the universe. And what this means though um, is that if we're going out and we're trying to see how things happen, how galaxies form, how stars form, how planets form, in astronomy, then, the processes that create these objects that we're interested in, they take a long time. We're talking about the process of star formation taking place over, over millions of years. And so it's not like we can go out and actually see a star. Oh, yeah, that star that wasn't there yesterday. That star must have just formed. It's a very, very slow, extraordinarily slow process. It's a lot like if somebody, you know, were to just show you a snapshot of a soccer game and so, well, what's going on here? And if, you, if you've never seen a soccer game and don't know about the rules or let alone even balls, trying to figure out then what's happening in that soccer game, the whole astronomy thing is, is almost very similar to that because these processes, we just get a snapshot of what's going on out there. Out there. Even, in the, even as stars are being formed and planets are being born, even as we speak, 
It's a very, very long and slow process relative to our own lifetime. But if you think about it, though, um, and this is just a, this is, oh, get back here. Um, there we go. This is just a, I don't know. This is just a quote then from a book. Um, it's a, it's a very, very old book. Um, but if you stop and think about it, though, and, and we will talk a little about this then over the course of the course of the summer. If you look here on Earth and you go, okay, we've got life here on Earth. For, for life as we understand it, then you need a planet. You need to be a certain distance from the star where you can have liquid water on the surface. Our, our life is based on the presence of liquid water. And our life then is basically based on carbon and oxygen and some nitrogen and trace amounts of heavy elements. And what are the odds of those ingredients and that sort of a setup then? What are the odds that that's out there? There, there, there may be other planets around other stars with that sort of a setup. And, and we've been you know, looking at other stars and finding other planets, other solar systems and around other stars. And there are thousands of these things known now, thousands of star systems that are known to have other planets around them. And some of those planets going around those stars are just at the right distance from their star where they can support liquid water on the surface. And so, okay, so we've got that. And if you stop and think about it, it's actually pretty common for stars to have planets around them. We've got a hundred billion stars in our solar system. There are a hundred billion galaxies with a hundred, sorry, not a hundred billion stars in our solar system, a hundred billion stars in our galaxy. There are a hundred billion galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in them. And it's not unusual for stars to have planets. And your head starts to explode thinking about the total number of possible planets in, in our universe. And a fraction of these then are going to be at the right distance from their star. Well, what about the other stuff then? The, the life that we uh, as we know it then, we need carbon and we need oxygen, maybe a little bit of nitrogen, a little bit of hydrogen. Uh, the most common elements in the universe in order are hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Those are the most common elements in the universe that, that, that we're made out of. So, so the, these elements then, they're not unusual. The situation, the, the planet then going around the star is not unusual. And this whole idea then of what are the odds then of other life then of being out there in our universe. And just personally, me, I think the odds are really pretty high because there's nothing special about what's going on here. There's nothing magical about the Earth and our solar system and what we have here on the Earth. And, and so what's the deal then? Why haven't we found other life out there? And, and the, I think the problem lies, I shouldn't say problem, that's pejorative, but, but the, 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 the situation then that arises, uh, um, yeah, and this is like eight planets instead of nine. It's an old book. Um, what happens here, now let me just jump right to the end here. Oh, I've lost my cursor. Dang, have it. There we go. There we go. What's going on here, though, is if you stop and think about how are we going to detect other life on other planets? Well, one of the ways to do it is as they develop technology, they'll start using radio waves, something like that. And you go, oh, wait a minute. Well, how about the Earth then? Well, we started broadcasting radio waves. We started broadcasting then signals that would leave the Earth's atmosphere in 1906. And so if you think about it then, what, what have we got? Like 115 years of radio signals. And so you can imagine then 150, so those radio signals that left here in 1906 then are about 115 light years then from our planet and from our solar system. And go back and when we talked about the sizes of things and the size of the, the Milky Way and the distances between stars, 115 light years in is really nothing. That's like the, there are a handful of stars then that are just starting to, to receive our radio signals. And sort of, you know, here's the Milky Way galaxy and there's a little blow up then and here's the Earth right here. And this little blue dot, maybe about, you know, a couple hundred uh, light years in, in diameter then, that's the size of our radio sphere. And, and thinking about then, well, you know, if there's life here, 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 we're all so far apart from each other <coughs> that, that they're, they're, you know, if they'd started at the same time we did, then there's no way their signals could have reached us by now. The, the issue then is just with the tremendous distances then uh, between stars. And it gets even worse, though, because if you, I don't use, I can't use words like worse, but it gets even trickier, though, because if you stop and think as we move over uh, to, you know, we've got a lot of our communications now as cable-based, fiber optics, things like that. Well, most of our traffic now is going over the Internet. 
And, and actually, we're getting more and more radio quiet as time goes on. And so our radio signature, its signature, as the technology is developing, we're actually getting fainter and fainter in the radio. And this idea that a truly advanced society uh, may not even, or a civilization may not even use radio at all. They may be advanced and beyond radio. How do we find them? All right, so more stuff to think about, though. Um, you know, if there is life out there, how do you find it? So anyways, all right. I think it's time for a break. I'm gonna have myself a couple of sips of coffee. Uh, you at home, if you need to go um, take care of something, um, I'm just gonna sort of hang out for about five minutes and we'll start up then um, with chapter two. So I will see you in five minutes. All right, so yeah, that looks like about five minutes. Uh, we'll pick this up again and uh, sort of start on the next topic or sort of the, the next chapter then really about the night sky and so we're you know, we're just returning back to earth and maybe we'll talk about something a little easier to wrap our heads around like the night sky and maybe the first thing to think about then is um how can we talk about where something is in the night sky how can, how can i tell you where a certain star is uh in all this and and you can say oh that's the bright thing you know kind of up and to the right of them other two stars and that's not really the best system uh for talking about where things are and maybe maybe we should even back up even further though and, and think about something very very similar and a similar problem how do we talk about where things are here on the earth and, and so, you know, how can I tell you where something is um, here on the earth? And, and there are different ways then of doing this, of, of uh, really sort of two ways of talking about then where something is on the earth and specifying then um, its location. And one way is to actually use um, basically an address or to set up a system then with boundaries and a system of addresses like we can say, oh, um, I want to send that then to my office, 525 River Street, Boone, North Carolina, 28608. And you go, oh, Boone, North Carolina then, uh, in the USA. And so that's almost the, sort of the reverse of what we were just doing with, with zooming away from Boone. This is sort of zooming in, where we say, okay, we've got the United States. So the location we're interested in is in the United States. Oh, the location we're interested in is in the state of North Carolina within the United States. Oh, the address we're interested then is in one of the 500 cities that's in Boone then uh, in the state of North Carolina in the United States. And oh, it's on River Street in Boone, 525 uh, River Street in Boone. So basically saying, you know, United States, North Carolina, Boone, and then street then, and specifying then where something is then just in terms of, of, of a location like that, using boundaries. And if you think about it, you know, and these boundaries then really are in some sense arbitrary. I mean, like this boundary then between Indiana and Ohio, this, this sort of vertical line running north-south here, that's really just sort of an arbitrary boundary. I mean, somebody just said, yeah, okay, we're going to put a line right here. Here's where the two states then, uh, here's Ohio and here's Indiana. It's a sort of arbitrary boundary. And, but you can do that, though. As long as everybody agrees on that boundary, it's all going to work. Because you can say, oh, it's a city in Ohio. It's a, you know, it's a Oxford, Ohio, right here on the Indiana-Ohio border. Oh, yeah, that's in Ohio. And as long as everybody agrees on these boundaries, it's going to work just fine. Another way to do it, though, is instead of, instead of using boundaries and, and names and sort of you know, countries and states and cities like that, another way to do it then is to just use coordinates. And so that's another way to talk about where something is then um, here on the surface of the earth. And this is what your GPS uses then. It uses coordinates. It uses then um, latitude and longitude. And if you remember, hopefully way back um, in, in other classes in, in school then, by the way, way back then, the, the idea then of latitude and longitude. And so the idea behind latitude then is if you watch the earth sit there and spin, oh, it's got the two poles, the north and south pole, halfway in between the poles then is the equator. Oh, well, that's a natural place to measure things from. And so we can talk about North Carolina, or we can talk about Chile then, in terms of how far north or south they are then, um, above or below the equator. And, and we're going to measure then maybe this distance in degrees, where, you know, something's on the equator at zero degrees, we get further and further north, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, until we get to the North Pole. Oh yeah, this is a 90 degree angle, the North Pole then is 90 degrees away from the equator. 
and likewise then with the south end going further and further south, and we put a negative sign in front of it just to let us know then that we're not moving north, we're moving south, and starting at zero degrees and going further and further south until you get to the south pole 90 degrees from the equator then, and talk about that latitude then as negative 90 degrees. And so talking about how far north or south something is then in terms of degrees relative to the equator, latitude, that makes perfect sense. You can also talk about then how far something is east or west. That's basically what's up with longitude. The trouble is, unlike latitude, where you've got the Earth's rotation and the equator for you know, creating a natural place to measure north and south from, you know, just, uh, just from the idea that the Earth is rotating. When you're talking about longitude, though, in east and west, there's no natural place. There's no and there, there's no spot then which it just makes sense to measure longitude from. There's no, there's no difference, you know, as you look across the face of the earth, east-west, uh, there's, there's nothing to really go on, like the equator. Um, and so really, uh, it's basically an arbitrary line then that somebody decided was zero. It happens to run through then Greenwich, England. And the real sort of reason why this is zero is the English were the first uh, first people to, to develop that reliable clocks that worked on ships. And you need a reliable clock uh, on a ship that in order to measure longitude, how far east or west you are from this line. And this is where the, the Royal Observatory was. So they based then the zero point of their clocks then on the clock at that observatory. They measured then their east-west position relative to the observatory on this line. And basically, uh, over time, and then it just became the accepted zero for, longi for, for uh, longitude. And, but that's the idea, though, is we've picked an arbitrary line then that runs from the North Pole to the South Pole through the equator, runs through Greenwich, England, and we can talk about how far something is east or west then, uh, basically from this line. And if you're looking at the line and you're going east then, again, we measure it in degrees and positive then moving east then and negative moving west. And so you look here in Boone, I think we're at about negative 88 or so longitude. That means then we're 88 degrees then west of this prime meridian running through Greenwich then. Uh, we're 88 degrees west of that. And if you think about our longitude or our latitude then, I think it's plus 37. So that's also then telling you, okay, you go 88 degrees to the west, from the west of the prime meridian and you go up 37 degrees from the equator. There you are. You're in Boone, North Carolina. And so this idea then of latitude and longitude is the other way to specify where something is on the Earth. And it's the exact same problem on the sky. We basically got, if you think about the sky, it's basically like we're embedded inside some giant sphere. And we're talking about that, oh, how do I, how do I, how do I point out where different things are then on the night sky? And one way to do it then is to use boundaries and names, just like just like countries and states and cities. And you can do the same thing then on the sky, where we've taken the sky then and we've divided it, divided it, divided it up into basically eighty-eight counties. You might want to think about that. Is that eighty-eight counties, or of course actual constellations? And so we can talk about then where something is, where a star is in terms of a constellation. Like I can tell you, oh, this star then, it's Alpha Ursa Majoris. And, and that, that actually is enough to tell me what star you're actually talking about. If you go, oh, that's Alpha Ursa Majoris, or oh, that's Beta Ursa Majoris. As an astronomer then, I know what star uh, you, you're talking about, what star you're going to be pointing at then. If you say, oh, it's Gamma, Gamma Orion. Oh, yeah, okay, I know what star that is. Um, and so that, that's one way to do it then, with these boundaries. And I'll, I'll circle back on that in a second. The other way to do it then is to use coordinates like latitude and longitude on the sky. Except for astronomers, instead of latitude and longitude, we use, uh, it's called right ascension and declination. And right ascension is, is essentially longitude. It's basically how far east or west you're looking. And declination then is basically the same as latitude. It's how far north or south you're looking. But, but the idea, it's just like what we talk about with coordinates here on the Earth. You can imagine this is the Earth and here is the sky then. It's almost like we're embedded then in, inside this sphere looking up. It's almost like a giant dark sphere that somebody spray painted little stars on. And we're sitting here on the Earth and we're, we're looking up at this sphere. And so we've got the Earth then basically rotating inside the sphere. Well, we can project the Earth's equator then up onto the sphere and talk about then the, the, the Earth's equator on the sphere, the celestial equator, and we can measure the positions of stars then 
Are they, they north of the, the celestial equator? Are they south of the celestial equator? Which is, again, just the Earth's equator projected up onto the sky. And just like the Earth has uh, an equator, there's also a north and south pole. Take the Earth's north pole projected up onto the sky, the north celestial equator. Take the Earth's south pole projected onto the sky, that's the south celestial equator. And talk about that, how far north or south of the celestial equator a star is. That's the declination. We can also talk about then how far a star is east or west on the celestial sphere. And we have the same problem then that we had um, here on the Earth, where what are we, what's the zero point going to be for east or west? And just like you know, people got around and said, okay, we're going to just, this, this line running through Greenwich, England, from no, the North Pole to the South Pole through the equator, we're going to call that the prime meridian, we're going to call that zero. For east-west on the sky, then, we measure it relative to a, to a spot, then, on the celestial equator that's known as the vernal equinox. And you can talk about, then, whether a star is east or west of that point, then, on the celestial sphere. Then, you know, is it east or west, then, of the vernal equinox? And you go, oh, what? Um, the vernal equinox, the, this is a fancy name for saying this is just where the sun is um, on March 21st. So this is really just the first day of spring. This is where the sun is on the first day of spring. I'm going to just take the celestial sphere and right there where the sun is then, I'm just going to spray paint a little X then on the sky and I'm going to measure then the positions of the stars east or west of that point then. Um, and, and I'm just going to call that my zero point. The only sort of difference though is um, if you think about um, longitude, we measure longitude here on the earth in degrees. Uh, the, the right ascension then in the sky, it's just like longitude. One of the differences though is it's actually instead of measured in degrees, so it's measured in hours. And that actually sort of makes sense if you think about sitting here on the earth and watching them the sky move overhead. How long does it take the sky then to return to the same position? How long does it take the sky to go through one rotation? And you go, well, wait a minute, it's 24 hours. That's sort of the definition of the day. How long does it take then before the sun returns to the same spot in the sky? And I'm being a little vague and sort of shellacking over some stuff here. We'll get into the details later, but that's the basic idea. 24 hours later then, this spot on the celestial sphere is back in the same spot, back in the same point in the sky then. And so what we do is we measure then these angles then in terms of hours. So you know, one hour right ascension then, oh, it just moves one hour in the sky then uh, per hour. And it just makes some of the timekeeping um, a little bit easier. But that's sort of the basic idea then, talking about where something is in the sky in terms of coordinates, just like latitude and longitude. And you'll do a lab uh, basically on that then. Just, and it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, but for constellations, and moving back, oh, I gave it away. Uh, going back to this idea of using boundaries to talk about then where stars are, those boundaries then are, of course, the constellations. And so constellations, oh, these are arbitrary patterns in the sky formed by stars. You can go out and you can see some of these patterns. You can see Pegasus. It looks like a big square in the sky. You can see Andromeda. It looks sort of like a big V in the sky. You can see Cassiopeia in the Queen's chair in the sky. You can go out and you can see the Big Bear um, and, and Ursa Major. And these are really just patterns of stars that people have just basically associated uh, with typically with some object. This gets, uh, I don't want to say it, um, this gets, there's a lot to talk about here. This, this can get you know, sort of complicated, but um, a couple of highlights, then, a couple of things to talk about that. Stars within constellations are rarely related to each other. If you go out then and you look at Ursa Major or you go out and you look at Perseus, the stars in Perseus, even though they're in the same constellation, are not really related to each other. Again, you're looking at the sky and you're seeing, when you look at the sky, then it's really hard to see um, sort of distance, depth with the sky. And, and to be honest, you can't at all. And when you see this pattern of stars in the sky, yeah, they can look next to it, like almost right next to each other in the sky, but oh, wait a minute, they have nothing to do with each other. They're, they're hundreds of light years apart. They just appear next to each other in our sky as we're looking at them. And so don't think that stars within constellations are related to each other. And also then the patterns that we see, um, or the, the, the constellations that are out there, that the, the constellations we use then basically come from antiquity and the Greeks, and they, they sort of talk then about 48 constellations then 
uh, before, basically developed before the year 500 AD. They talked about these 48 different constellations. But, you know, the Greeks didn't know much about the Southern Hemisphere. And so there were a whole, there were a whole bunch of the sky then that, you know, no constellations had been associated with. And so uh, by sort of modern times, during the 1700s, then they went in and sort of filled in the rest of the sky then with these missing constellations that the, uh, that the Greeks missed, and giving us then these total of, uh, this total of 88 constellations. And you can tell which ones are the constellations from antiquity and which ones are the more recent. You go, you go down into the southern hemisphere, and there's the constellation microscope, and there's the constellation telescope. And, and you're looking and you go, well, the Greeks didn't know about these things. And yeah, that's because that's a modern constellation um, as opposed to the, the constellations of antiquity. And again, we just, we just sort of uh, took these then from the Greek constellations. Um, different cultures then had their own constellations. You can't help yourself but to go out at night and look at the night sky and start seeing patterns and start making connections, because that's how we're wired. If I show you a whole bunch of random points in your head, you can't help yourself. You're going to start making connections. You're going to start connecting dots, and you're going to start seeing things then in those patterns, even if they're truly random. And that's really what's going on with the constellations. And so we just took these patterns then and just adopted, and adopted them, though, as a way of talking about where things are on the sky. And so modern astronomers use the constellations to divide up the entire sky so that every star belongs to a constellation. And, and you go, well, wait a minute, then, you know, you go, how, many, how many visible stars do you think there are? If you could see the entire sky, uh, all 360 degrees, the whole full sky, how many individual stars do you think that you can see, that you can resolve, that you can identify? And it turns out the number is about 6,000. And, and that's, that's, well, gosh, that's not a lot of stars, considering we live in a galaxy with 100 billion stars. There are many, 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 many more stars that are out there than, that are too faint to see. And we need some way of talking about where they are. And this idea then of using the constellations, using these boundaries then to establish where these stars are. So I can say, oh, the stars in Orion, oh, the stars in Perseus, I'll have a general idea of where to look. Just like saying, oh, this address is in Boom. I got a pretty good idea of where to look. This address then is in Columbus. I got a pretty good idea of where to look. And then you go, wait, Columbus, Georgia, or Columbus, Ohio? Uh -huh. Oh, so, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem with the name things. Anyways, all right. But, but that's sort of the, the, the basic idea here. So you can look then at these constellations and basically they have come and they draw a boundary around the constellation and they talk about all the stars then within that constellation or within that boundary then being in that constellation. I'll show you a, a, an image of that then um, in a second. But I can go out then and I can talk about a star um, where, there we go. So I can talk about then uh, a star like this one. And you'll notice then this is the constellation in Ursa Majoris. There's sort of the, the artist's sort of representation of you know, the constellation as the big bear. And this is one then that's probably familiar to everybody because part of this constellation, if you look, there are these four stars here and then these other three stars sort of coming off it. This is actually the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper then is actually just sort of a small part of the much larger Ursa, Ursa Major constellation. The Big Dipper is an example then of what's known as an asterism. It's a grouping of stars um, that's a, a part of a constellation, but it's not the entire constellation, but it's often referred to then as its own thing, like the Pleiades and the Seven Sisters in Taurus. Um, that's an asterism. And you're looking, oh yeah, that's the Seven Sisters, um, but they're part of a much, much larger constellation that is Taurus. And the same thing then with the with uh, the Big Dipper in the constellation then of Ursa Major. So the Big Dipper isn't a constellation, it's a subset of a constellation. It's an asterism. Um, but talking about Ursa Major then, uh, the Big Dipper, and identifying then um, stars in the Big Dipper. So I can talk about, you know, this star here, or this star, or this star. And gosh, what to say about this thing? Um, you'll notice that some of the stars, like this one, 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 and uh, actually have names associated with them then, like Mizar and Dube and Merak. And if you look at the names of a lot of stars then, like, um, uh, like Aldebaran and Arcturus, um, a lot of these stars then you'll find, uh, basically they have Arab names. And that's because they were named 
uh, back in, in the heyday of, of Islamic science and, oh gosh, what was that? The, the 9th through the 13th centuries then, a uh, huge boom in astronomy then, at, at you know, the is, Islamic golden age. And what the, what the astronomers did in that time then was they gave the stars names. And so that's one way to identify a star. If you say, oh, I'm going to go out and look at Mizar tonight, I know exactly what star you're looking at. You go, oh, I'm going to go look at Betelgeuse tonight. I know exactly what star you're going to look at. So that's one way to identify stars is to actually just give them individual names. The trouble is there's a lot of stars that we're going to run out of names and uh, very, very quickly. So another way to identify stars is to go within a constellation and, and maybe talk about the brightest star in the constellation, and then the next brightest star in the constellation, and then the third brightest star in the constellation. And that's what's up with these little sort of Greek letters here, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. Uh, that's another way to identify the stars, is to, to start with the constellation, and the brightest star is alpha, the next brightest star is beta, and so on then. And so we can talk about a star then like, like Alcade or Mizar, something like that. We can also talk about stars then in terms of the Greek letter and the constellation name, or the genitive form of the constellation name. These are referred to then as Bayer, like aspirin, uh, the Bayer designations. So you can say, oh, I'm going to go look at Alpha Ursa Majoris. And I know that you're going to go look at Dubai right here, Dubai right here. And I also know then that you're looking at the brightest star in the constellation. And you can say, oh, no, no, I'm going to actually go out and look at, I don't know, Delta Ursa Majoris here then. And I know you're going to go look at Megrez there. And I also know you're looking at the fourth brightest star in the constellation. And so that's what's up with the Bayer designations. You start with the brightest star and just work your way down, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on. There's a third way to talk about where the star is in terms of the constellation, and these are referred to then as Flamsteed designations, where basically you're, you're looking at the constellation and you're giving the stars a number then basically just in terms of, of right ascension then. And so you can have a, a star like 47 Ursa Majoris then, you're just going then through Ursa Major. Here's 23 uh, Ursa Major. You're basically going then from west to east and giving the stars then um, numbers based on their right ascension. And that then is the Flamstead designation. All of these, though, are ways of talking then about where a star is, either in terms of where it is in the constellation in terms of brightness, where it is in the constellation in terms of right ascension, or just give, plain giving the thing a name. And so here is an actual star map then that shows Ursa Major, and you can see then the boundary lines for the constellation, the, the boundary lines for the constellation here. Any star then that falls within this boundary, again, think of it like a county line. Any star then that for, is within this, this boundary then is part of the Ursa Major constellation. You've got Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and so on. And you've also got 15, 18, 23, 36, 56. Notice as I'm going this way, then the numbers are getting bigger, 78, 83. So basically, you know, talking about them on the flame state designation then for the star. And these are all different ways then of identifying a star and talking then about where the, the star is um, in the sky. And so we can talk about, you know, if the star then has a proper name, uh, Vega, Arcturus, Deneb, that's one way of identifying the star. You can also do the bear name thing then, um, where it's the genitive form of the constellation, or some majoris, then, and an alpha for the brightest, beta for the second brightest, and so on then. And these are, you know, so I could talk about Merak or beta or some majoris. It's the same star. Or Vega then is Alpha Lyra, the brightest star in the constellation Lyra. Deneb then is Alpha Cygni. It's the brightest star in the Cygnus constellation. Um, all right, and so typically then within the constellation, the brightest star is Alpha, second brightest is Beta, and so on. And again, you know, just a quick reminder, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, this is the beginning of the Greek alphabet there, uh, sort of uh, in order. All right, and you go, well, fine. Those, are, those usually are the nice bright stars that I can see, that I can go out and see then maybe without a telescope. What about the fainter stars? There's a lot more, there are a lot more stars out there than what I can actually see um, with my unaided eye. And those fainter stars then are typically given names that have nothing to do with the constellation. Um, they're usually part of a star catalog. And they're given then basically the name of the star, star catalog then and some sort of identification of that star within that catalog. And this is, you know, we, 
Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not, okay, I'm not going to make you remember the names of these cat catalogs. I can tell you're already worried about that. But you can go look at some star and, oh, look, it's HD uh, 213859. And you go, the HD, though, stands for the Henry Draper catalog. It was a catalog then that was done out of Harvard in the early 1900s where they went and looked at, what is it, about 350,000 stars that were, oh gosh, we haven't talked about magnitudes yet, a little bit fainter than the human eye limit then, and they went and they cataloged these all in terms of temperature and things like that. Then. And this is the 213,859th entry in that catalog. That's one way of talking then, um, about that star. There's another, there's another catalog then, a German catalog then, um, the Bonner, I can never remember, this, the Bonner Dumstrong catalog then, where these stars then, um, they were split into bands of declination. And so this is a star then, it's 13 degrees above the celestial equator. And in that one degree wide band then, all the way around the celestial sphere, 13 degrees above the equator, this is the 2319th star then in that catalog. Um, there was also the Bergdorfer, the Bergdorfer spectral uh, Dunstrong catalog, German catalog then, um, and this star then is also uh, entry 8 stroke 1 or 397 then in that catalog. <laughs> there are a bunch of different ways then to refer to then these stars. And so uh, you can talk about for the brighter stars, oh, you can give it a Bayer designation or a Flamsteed designation. If it's a really bright star, maybe even it has its own name. Um, or for the most part, though, most of the stars we end up looking at then are just referred to then as their, their catalog. And again, I'm not going to make you remember the catalog names or anything like that, but just know that, um, that, that that's out there. And I, I wish we had more time because the whole history of constellations, the lore of constellations, it's fascinating stuff. If you're interested in history, there's lots of books out there that you can go and find and read then about the histories of constellations. And I guess the thing to remember, though, is really every culture has its own set of constellations. Um, if you look at the constellations, of the uh, like the ancient Chinese constellations, um, we're, we're, we'll talk more about this later, but there's stars then that are near the North Pole, as seen here in the Northern Hemisphere, that are near Polaris, near the North Celestial Pole. Those stars never set. Those are, we call those circumpolar stars. And into the Chinese, those were the most important stars because they never went below the horizon. And those were the stars of the emperor. And, and as you get further and further away from that, to stars then that spend less and less time above the, above the horizon, those stars then were associated with, with less and less important uh, uh, houses and, and seats of government and things like that. Um, the, the, the Native Americans had their own constellations, some of which are, are just amazing. And you've got that, like the, the spider constellation with its web and the, the three hunters then chasing the bear and uh, the sort of the rabbit and the canoe race. You had all of these constellations then. And so, yes, we, we appropriated then the, the constellations of the ancient Greeks, Basically, because we're, we're going to talk about this going back to Hipparchus and the making of the first star catalogs and all of that sort of traces back to them. But everybody has their own set of, uh, of constellations. Every culture has their own sort of myths um, about the sky. It's just amazing stuff. Um, all right, we've got a couple minutes left. And so I want to see just a quick test here then. Um, so here would be, I don't know. The third brightest star in the constellation of Leo, which one do you think it would be? Alpha Leonis, Beta Leonis, Gamma Leonis, or Epsilon Leonis? And remember, we use the genitive name of the constellations and, and the Bayer designations, but I'm not going to remember. I'm not going to ask you, oh, what's the genitive name of the constellation Leo, and have you remember Leonis. But, but I will ask you then maybe something like this, which, which one of these stars is the third brightest in the constellation? And I've put them in order. So hint, hint, um, yeah, gamma then being the third letter of the Greek alphabet, um, the third brightest star in the constellation Leo would be Gamma Leonis. Well, how about this one then? So which of these stars then um, is going to be the brightest in the sky? Which of these is likely going to be the brightest in the sky? Alpha Aquarii, Beta Guatis, Gamma Canis Majoris, or Gamma Draconis? We'll give you a second to think about that one. And the answer is, that's ah, a trick question. You can't, you don't know enough to answer this. Oh, what? 
And remember, though, the idea is the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, you're talking about the brightness of a star within its constellation. If you've got a constellation like Ophiuchus that doesn't have a lot of bright stars in it, then Alpha Ophiuchus is not going to be a bright star. And so you can look at a star at a constellation like Orion that maybe has just like a ton of really, really bright stars. Like the fifth brightest star in Orion is still going to be brighter than the brightest star in Ophiuchus. And so the alpha, beta, gamma stuff, that's only relative to stars within a given constellation. You can't use that then to compare stars within other constellations. And so just keep that in mind. And yes, Alpha Aquarius is the brightest constellation in that star, but, uh, but actually, yeah, uh, Beta Boatis then is actually brighter than that, brighter than uh, uh, Alpha Aquarius. So, all right, so keep that in mind. All right, looking at this, um, I am seeing it is 11.55. Uh, already, I didn't get as far as I'd hoped we'd gotten, but that's okay because we're going to talk about the magnitude system of brightness next, and uh, nobody likes that. Um, so uh, this might be actual good place to start. I do have a couple minutes left, though, if there are any questions about anything. Oh, dear. I've either explained everything perfectly well or I've put everybody to sleep. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, super excellent question. So somebody is asking, uh, for the people watching the recording, somebody is asking whether or not something outside the observable universe would be older or younger. Um, and that is an excellent question. I'm just going to say it really can't be older because, oh gosh, when you talk about the Big Bang, um, everything in the universe is about 13.8 billion years old or younger. And so you can't have anything older than that. But, but the question is tricky and an excellent question because the, the trouble is it's just too far away to see right now because there hasn't been, hasn't been enough time for the light from that object to reach us. And so it gets weird, though, when you can say, all right, well, you know, it's beyond that 90, it's beyond that 93 uh, billion light year bubble that we can see. It's a little bit beyond that. Well, maybe a billion years from now, maybe then we will be able to see it. And at that point, when we see it, it'll be 4.8 billion years old because we had to wait for that billion years for the universe to expand even more. And so kind of yes, kind of no. It's it's. It's a strange thing to think about, but everything we can see in the observable universe right now, that, that edge then is you know, basically stuff 13.8 billion years old. If we wait longer, we'll be able to see then the stuff that's beyond that, but we'll also be seeing it then when it's older. Oh, did that make any sense? <laughs> this is just, the, this is the stuff that keeps you up late at night. Um, but excellent question. Other questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's fine. Oh, okay. So this is a question then about, and you hear people talk about this. So the question is about whether or not, you know, I, I talked about a three-dimensional universe. And, and the question then is, where does time fit in in this, and whether or not you know you can think of time as a fourth dimension, and and that gets into so gosh, what do we want to say about that? The whole idea behind dimensions is is really from a from a mathematics and a physics sort of sense is what do I need to describe where something is? And so if I think about the surface of the Earth, that's really just two dimensional. Because I can talk about where something is, north, south, east, west. I need two dimensions to describe where it is. Or if I'm thinking about it in terms of three-dimensional space, I might need to know where something is east, west, north, south, and then how high up above the ground it is. Or maybe I could talk about this room and where something is in the room. And I could measure from this corner and I could say, well, it's four feet in that direction, three feet in that direction, and two feet up. And to describe where it is in three-dimensional three space, I need three uh, 
basically coordinates them to specify where it is. Or just think about a one-dimensional system where I've got basically a string and I want to talk about where a knot on the string is. And I go, oh, that, that, string, that knot then is two feet from the start. And I only need to specify that two, two feet because it's a one-dimensional system. And that, that relationship then between the dimension and how many numbers, how many coordinates do I need to describe where something is. And that's why people talk about time then as a fourth dimension. Because I can talk about something right here in this room, this far from the corner, that far from the wall, and then that high up. But I can also then talk about, well, when was that there? Has it been there all the time? Was it only there from, from 10 to 2 on Tuesdays? And thinking about then as time is the fourth dimension or a coordinate then that I need to specify where something was. So it's physical, you know, so I need, you know, if it's in 3D space, then I need three coordinates to specify its location. And I need that fourth coordinate then to specify when it is. And so in the most general sense, you'll hear people talk about time as a fourth dimension in that capacity. It gets weirder, though, if you get into the relativity thing and this relationship then between time and space and how they're, they're sort, of, sort of tangled together. But time really isn't actually sort of a fourth spatial dimension. I, does that sort of make sense? It's sort of really just specifying when something is. But in order to give you the location of something, I may need to specify time. So it is a fourth dimension. Oh, is it good? Other questions? All right. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed the first lecture. Uh, I will be back here at 10 o'clock tomorrow for the, for the next one. Um, and if you're watching the recording, um, thank you and good. You're watching it. Uh, don't forget then that there's also Lead Lab from 8 to 10 tonight. And I will, I will have office hours right after this, giving some time to, to, to take everything apart and move it. And um, I will also have office hours. I'll be available on Zoom tonight then from 8 to 10 for the lab, too, which will just be about uh, units and significant figures and all the delightful stuff um, that goes with it. All right. So um, I will perhaps see you tonight and uh, have a good day. And thanks for stopping by. It's much more fun with people here. <laughs>